EMZT Radio is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audio download and a free 30-day trial at audibletrial.com slash EMZT. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Welcome to another episode of EMZT Radio. I'm Bane Hellborn, and my sister, Scorpio Girl, is sitting in for MJ, who's still in the process of moving. So... We got this. <laughs> <laughs> it, Chapter 2, coming out September 6, 2019. Mercy. Yeah. I haven't even seen the first one, but I've seen the original. Yeah, we are we know the original a little better than this one. Um, Bill Skarsgård is Pennywise. He adds a, a creep factor that Tim Curry couldn't do. You know what, though? Watching Castle Rock, yeah. he does a really great... Creep. creep. He has a creep factor. Even even though, you know, if you haven't been watching it, you should, because I was like, eh, because I'm, I'm kind of, like, I could do all right in a Stephen King kind of references, but, mm-hmm. and I know I'm missing a lot with Castle Rock, but with where we're at right now, his character, it's like, first he was evil, then he was good, now it's just like, what the fuck is going on here? Yeah. So definitely, definitely A plus and gold star for yeah. portraying a brilliant creep. Yeah, and apparently Stephen King sent the tweet out himself to fans about Chapter 2 coming. Oh, okay. Yeah. So he's on board. He's on board. Eh, more or less, yeah, on board. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I just thought I'd uh, put in there, if you ever get bored and want to know what upcoming horror movies are... Um, definitely go to imdb.com and uh, they have have tons of wonderful lists, but there is uh, 92 of upcoming horror movies from 2018, 2019 and beyond. Mm -hmm. Definitely check it out because it seems like, of course, they're doing a lot of reboots. Ignore those unless you're open-minded or a fan. (laughs) Open-minded. (laughs) Open-minded. I am not. (laughs) But there are a lot of interesting titles coming up, which um, really, I mean, like I said, there's 94 of them. So I don't know. What do you think, Bane? What are some of the ones you're kind of looking forward to? Well, 47 meters down the next chapter sounds interesting because we were kind of left hanging at the end of the first one of what happened. There about to be rescued but what happened after that um oh um i am always been a fan of rob zombie from yeah. when he came out you know in the very beginning with his music yeah but apparently 2019 uh definitely check uh keep a lookout for three from hell yeah which is a sequel to devil's rejects how- right but how right Even- i was there when sid Haig said there's no way they could make a sequel because they're all dead. Well, Rob <laughs> Zombie has found a way. Oh, man. So that's, I that's mean, all the only that's... one. The only one out of the Firefly family to survive was Tiny. But then that actor died after the movie came out. Well, it doesn't so. mean that the character died, actually. Yeah. But yeah. yeah, that's all that you get told from it uh, because it's in post-production right now is oh that it's a God. sequel to devil's reject oh my god yeah um uh, apparently in 2020 a quiet place too yes okay i've and always... it's it's not going to be the same family it's going to be a different family i yeah. oh we, I, you know i was leery about watching it only because you know it's john krasinski yeah and all i know of him is you know his iconic role as jim jim from helper the so but i very interesting concept i think it was great yeah. Yeah, and who? <laughs> I was like, no way the kids would survive. Kids cannot be that yeah. quiet. <laughs> no, I was actually, I was not shocked in the very beginning of the movie. I'm not going to tell you what happened or what, anything if you haven't seen it, but I was yeah. not shocked at all. Yeah. When I saw the kids, I was like, yep, those are the, what shirts in Star Trek? The red shirts. Those are the red, red shirts. shirts. <laughs> red Star shirts. Trek. Yeah, and the whole, she gave birth when the creature was in the house and she didn't make a room. sound. It was in the same, it was in the bathroom with her though. No, no, she, no, it wasn't. It was downstairs. But didn't it come up? Yeah. And she's trying to keep the baby quiet and she's trying not to scream because she had a, you know, the nail went through her foot 
And then she's giving birth. She's going through the whole labor thing on her own in a bathtub. How the hell did that creature not hear her? She's that good, man. She was that good. Um, yeah. One remake I am really looking forward to because I was so fascinated when it came out the first time. And that kind of spun me into getting into conspiracy theories. Yeah. And, you know, it's hidden history, uh, real life history, is uh, they're remaking Jacob's Ladder. Yeah. It's uh, due to come out February 1st of next year. Well, But I'm really interested to see if, is is it going to be just a true word for word remake, which will be disappointing. Yeah. Or are they going to actually get into more of what Jacob's Ladder yeah. was? I felt the original didn't tell the whole story. Well, no, because it only focused on Jacob's trying to keep a grasp yeah. on uh, his sanity. Because in the deleted scenes, it kept hinting that the uh, the army was trying to hide things and uh, they didn't want anything to get out. I mean, it was kind of touched on a little in the movie, but they didn't really get in but depth there to is, what this group knew. But there is a real uh, experiment that was conducted during the Vietnam uh, War mm-hmm. on men uh, on the soldiers called Jacob's Ladder. So yeah. um, definitely, if you want to just get a little backstory, uh, definitely check out the real deal experiments. Yeah. It definitely, like I said, this was the movie way back when, when it first came out, that got me into all these conspiracy yeah. theories and hidden experiments. Well, and Because that's what they were all hinting at, that the army was trying to hide something that happened to them. They didn't want nobody talking about it. But I hope they really get into more of the backstory about that. Yeah. Apparently, which I'm never going to see, but they're coming out with a Grudge in 2019. Oh my God, they're rebooting the Grudge. Well, it doesn't actually say rebooting, um, but you figure if it has the same name, and, and all it's the same and all story. it says, all it says is a house is cursed by a vengeful ghost that dooms those who enter it with a violent death. Yeah. That's, so I mean, it'd yeah, be interesting again if it's. I, I just hate the word say for the, words. Does it say the director? I want to see the director. Um, the director is Peace. It's not Pierce. Oh, Pesci. Pesci. Nicholas Pesci. Oh, I wonder if it's any relation. Huh. Looks like Jeff Bueller is a screenplay. So let's. I don't know if he was from the original. N- no. Oh, the original plan was to reboot the series completely, featuring a new storyline that ab- abandons the Saiki family. Yeah. However, it's strongly rumored to instead be a sequel to the American trilogy that preceded it. Okay. A so, sequel. So okay. interesting. Interesting. I, I, I am not a fan. Grudge. <laughs> Those, uh, you know, uh, the grudge and the ring and all that shit. That was like real scary. I think scary. there's three, three grudges. Well, the, the original and two sequels already. So this is going to be grudge four. I don't care. It's too scary to watch. And I'm just, yeah. I'm going to puss out on this one. Yeah. Uh, looks like World War Z two is happening. It's to be announced. Um, wrong Re- turn two to be announced. They're rebooting Child's Play. We rebooting know. Child's Play. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, the Conjuring three is coming out. If it hasn't already, it looks like the Boy two. No way. <laughs> the Boy two. I'm not familiar. That was- about after, the doll. After a family moves into the Heelshire mansion, their young son soon makes friends with a lifelike doll called Brahms. Yeah. Oh, this yeah. one? Yeah. I was disappointed. Oh, my gosh. I was disappointed when you find out the whole thing. Yeah, yeah was, that it was... It was a letdown. How can you part to that? I oh. mean, you could. I mean, hopefully if you rewrote the whole script yeah. and changed the <laughs> plot... But just kept the characters. And, and make it like they advertised it. Right? <laughs> yeah. Right? Apparently they're doing a Trick or Treat 2. Trick or Treat 2. A sequel to the 2007. Seven. Nice. That's long overdue. Yeah. I love anthology films. Right? Yeah. But definitely, you know, if you're bored and you want to know, hey, what horror films are coming out, definitely my go-to is imdb.com. And unfortunately, we're not sponsored, but... Yeah. You know, this is where I like to get my info, <laughs> my 411 on the blood. And uh, there's a trailer out for The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. It's a holiday, it's a winter solstice episode mm-hmm. coming out December 14th. And uh, it says season two will come out April 5th. So the lawsuit has not hindered the production. Thank you. Yeah, universe. Thank you. 
Thank you, thank you. Because uh, I did a, a a news update on on the last podcast about uh, the lawsuit was settled amicably. We don't know how much they got, but as long as the Satanic Temple is credited for the Baphomet statue in every episode they show it, they are golden. So yes, and there will be season two starting April fifth. Yes. I'm excited for that. That's a really good show. It's uh, Sabrina has a new look because She's... she did something she was avoiding the whole series. <laughs> so Well, of course. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Anything else? Uh, seeing that it's December, keep an eye out for Krampus. Yeah. The way things are going, I think Krampus will make a, a visit. <laughs> Santa ain't going to be coming. It's going to be Krampus. You're all getting eaten. <laughs> and coal. Krampus. Shoved up your ass. <laughs> coal shoved up your ass. Yes. <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be very appropriate. <laughs> nice one. Anyway. Well, let's get to some music on EMZT Radio.
be intolerant, different equal people, small minded judgments and burning cross. It is bad to be alone. Alone. Bad. Friend. Good. Friend. The show that puts the story back into history. History is all about discovering the why. And I think that in that process, it's important to never take the story out of history. Making history come alive. One episode at a time. But this is a podcast on the American Revolution for this series and uh, all about a free country, so do whatever the hell you want. Visit themondayamerican.com to get more. Dive into the Monday American. Don't worry, we'll be gentle. Hey everyone, this is Beaumont Bob from Bone with Bobcat. You can listen to me live every Monday night at 10 p.m. Eastern at sfdradio.com, where I'm bringing you the best of the worst in cheap booze, Talking bum wine, beers, 40s, malt liquor, and more. Always featuring the latest and greatest in the world of drinking and entertainment, along with some special guests. So come on down and take a ride with Bum Wine Bob. If you can't be there live, you can always listen in the archives at bumwinebob.com. So sit back, relax, grab a drink, and enjoy. Cheers. Hi everybody, Miss Starling here for Starling's All-American Lamb Chops. Have you thought about dinner tonight? I know I have. Usually, it's some cow, there's some chicken, and some pig roaming around somewhere. But have you thought about lamb? Lamb is all natural. It's all great. And plus, it ain't that bad for the environment like them nasty cows and them nasty pigs. Starlings. All American lamb chops. Made right here in our farms in West Virginia. And you can't get any better grass-fed lamb than what you see in the stores. Remember, it's got to have the name Starling written on it for it to be high quality. That's what we only ship. The highest quality lamb meat all around these great United States. God bless America. I sure do love it. Start Starling's All-American Lamb Chops. It's guaranteed to make you scream for more. Jesus Christ! Without a oh, 
this is Luke and Wolf, and you're tuned in to the delightful darkness of EMZT Radio. Good evening. This is Christopher Lee. Feeling relaxed? We'll soon put pay to that. Time for a fireside tale. Now, I've a bone to pick with you. Several, in fact. And they're all strung together in Jerome K. Jerome's The Man of Science. I met a man in the Strand one day that I knew very well, as I thought, though I had not seen him for years. We walked together to Charing Cross, and there we shook hands and parted. Next morning, I spoke of this meeting to a mutual friend, and then I learned for the first time that the man had died six months before. The natural inference was that I'd mistaken one man for another. What was remarkable about the matter, however, was that throughout our walk... I had conversed with the man under the impression that he was that other dead man. And whether by coincidence or not, his replies had never once suggested to me my mistake. As soon as I finished, Jefferson, who had been listening very thoughtfully, asked me if I believed in spiritualism to its fullest extent. Well, that's rather a large question. What do you mean by spiritualism to its fullest extent. Let me put a definite case. Suppose a man died with the dearest wish of his heart unfulfilled. Do you believe that his spirit might have power to return to earth and complete the interrupted work? I was told a story this morning at the hospital by an old French doctor, said Jefferson. The story begins with a great wrong done by one man unto another man. What the wrong was, I do not know. I'm inclined to think, however, it was connected with the woman. Still, that is only conjecture, and the point is immaterial. A man who had done the wrong fled, and the other man followed him. It became a point-to-point -point race, the first man having the advantage of a day's start. The course was the whole world, and the stakes by the first man's life. The first man, never knowing how far or how near the other was behind him, and hoping now and again that he might have baffled him, would rest for a while. The second man, knowing always just how far the first one was before him, never paused, and thus each day the man who was spurred by hate drew nearer to the man who was spurred by fear. At this town, the answer to the never varied question would be at seven o'clock last evening, monsieur. Seven? Ah, eighteen hours. Give me something to eat, quick, while the horses are being put to. At the next, the calculation would be sixteen hours. Passing a lonely chalet, monsieur put his head out of the window. How long since a carriage passed this way, with a tall, fair man inside? Such a one passed early this morning, monsieur. Thanks. Drive on. A hundred francs apiece if you're through the pass before daybreak. And what for dead horses, monsieur? Twice their value when living. One day, the man who was ridden by fear looked up and saw before him the open door of a cathedral, and passing in, knelt down and prayed. He prayed long and fervently. He prayed that he might be forgiven his sin, and more important still, that he might be delivered from his adversary. And a few chairs from him, facing him, knelt his enemy, praying also. But the second man's prayer, being a thanksgiving, merely, was short, so that when the first man raised his eyes, he saw the face of his enemy gazing at him across the chair tops, 
with a mocking smile upon it. He made no attempt to rise, but remained kneeling, fascinated by the look of joy that shone out of the other man's eyes. And the other man moved the high-backed chairs one by one and came towards him softly. Then, just as the man who had been wronged stood beside the man who had wronged him, full of gladness that his opportunity had come, there burst from the cathedral tower a sudden clash of bells, and the man whose opportunity had come broke his heart and fell back dead, with that mocking smile still playing round his mouth. And so he lay there. Then the man who had done the wrong rose up and passed out, praising God. What became of the body of the other man is not known. Years passed away, and the survivor and the tragedy became a worthy and useful citizen and a noted man of science. In his laboratory were many objects necessary to him in his researches, and prominent among them stood in a certain corner a human skeleton. It was a very old and much mended skeleton, and one day the long-expected end arrived and it tumbled to pieces. Thus it became necessary to purchase another. A man of science visited a dealer he well knew within the shadow of the towers of Notre Dame. The little parchment-faced old man had just the very thing that Monsieur wanted, a singularly fine and well-proportioned study. It should be sent round and set up in Monsieur's laboratory that very afternoon. The dealer was as good as his word. When Monsieur entered his laboratory that evening, the thing was in its place. Monsieur seated himself in his high-backed chair and tried to collect his thoughts. But Monsieur's thoughts were unruly and inclined to wander, and to wander always in one direction. Monsieur opened a large volume and commenced to read. He read of a man who had wronged another and fled from him, the other man following. Finding himself reading this, he closed the book angrily and went and stood by the window and looked out. He saw before him the sun-pierced nave of a great cathedral, and on the stones lay a dead man with a mocking smile upon his face. Cursing himself for a fool, he turned away with a laugh. <laughs> but his laugh was short-lived for it seemed to him that something else in the room was laughing also. <laughs> Struck suddenly still, with his feet glued to the ground, he stood listening for a while, then sought with starting eyes the corner from where the sound seemed to come. But the white thing standing there was only grinning. Monsieur wiped the damp sweat from his head and hands, and stole out. For a couple of days, he did not enter the room again. On the third, he opened the door and went in. To shame himself, he took his lamp in his hand, and crossing over to the far corner where the skeleton stood, examined it. A set of bones, bought for three hundred francs. Was he a child? to be scared by such a bogey. He held his lamp up in front of the thing's grinning head. The flame of the lamp flickered as though a faint breath had passed over it. The man explained this to himself by saying that the walls of the house were old and cracked and that the wind might creep in anywhere. He repeated this explanation to himself as he recrossed the room, walking backwards with his eyes fixed on the thing. When he reached his desk, he sat down and gripped the arms of his chair till his fingers turned white. He tried to work, 
but the empty sockets in that grinning head seemed to be drawing him towards them. Glancing fearfully about him, his eye fell upon a high screen standing before the door. He dragged it forward and placed it between himself and the thing so that he could not see it nor it see him. Then he sat down again to his work. For a while, he forced himself to look at the book in front of him, but at last, unable to control himself any longer, he suffered his eyes to follow their own bent. It may have been an hallucination. He may have accidentally placed the screen so as to favor such an illusion. But what he saw was a bony hand coming round the corner of the screen. Ah! And with a cry, he fell to the floor in a swoon. The people of the house came running in and lifting him up, carried him out and laid him upon his bed. As soon as he recovered, his first question was, where had they found the thing? Where was it? And when they told him they had seen it standing where it always stood, he listened to their talk about overwork and the necessity for change and rest, and said they might do with him as they would. So for many months, the laboratory door remained locked. Then there came a chill autumn evening, when the man of science opened it again and closed it behind him. He lighted his lamp and sat down in his high-backed chair, and the old terror returned to him. But this time he meant to conquer himself. His nerves were stronger now, and his brain clearer. He would fight his unreasoning fear. He crossed to the door and locked himself in, flung the key to the other end of the room, where it fell among jars and bottles with an echoing clatter. Later on, his old housekeeper going her final round, tapped at his door and wished him good night, as was her custom. She received no response at first, and growing nervous, tapped louder and called again. And at length, an answering good night came back to her. She thought little about it at the time, but afterwards she remembered that the voice that had replied to her had been strangely grating and mechanical. Trying to describe it, she likened it to such a voice as she would imagine coming from a statue. Next morning, his door remained still locked. When evening came and he did not appear, his servants gathered outside the room. They listened, but could hear no sound. They shook the door and called to him, and beat with their fists upon the wooden panels. No sound came from the room. Becoming alarmed, they decided to burst open the door. He sat, bolt upright, in his high-backed chair. When they drew near and the light fell upon him, they saw the livid marks of bony fingers round his throat. And in his eyes there was a terror such as is not often seen in human eyes. Brown was the first to break the silence that followed. He asked me if I had any brandy on board. He said he felt he should like just a nip of brandy before going to bed. That's one of the chief charms of Jefferson's stories. They always make you feel you want a little brandy. These fireside tales are abridged by Tamsin Collison, with music by Chris O'Shaughnessy and produced by Frank Sterling. They are a unique production for Radio 2. This is Christopher Lee 
wishing you a very good night. Dungeons and Dragons. Satan's Game. Your children, like it or not, are attracted in their weaker years to the occult, and a game like D&D fuels their imagination and makes them feel special while drawing them deeper and deeper into the bowels of El Diablo. This afternoon, the Dead Ale Wives Watchtower invites you to sit in on an actual gaming session. Observe the previously unobservable as a hidden camera takes you to the inner sanctum of Dungeons and Dragons. Gallstaff, you have entered the door to the north. You are now by yourself, standing in a dark room. The pungent stench of mildew emanates from the wet dungeon walls. Where are the Cheetos? They're right next to you. I cast a spell. Where's the Mountain Dew? In the fridge, duh. I want to cast a spell. Can I have a Mountain Dew? Yes, you can have a Mountain Dew. Just go get it. I can cast any of these, right? On the list? Yes, any any of the first level ones. I'm going to get a soda. Anyone want one? Hey, Graham, I'm not in the room, right? What room? I want to cast Magic Missile. The room where he's casting all these spells from. He hasn't cast anything yet. I am, though, if you'd listen. I'm casting Magic Missile. Why are you casting Magic Missile? There's nothing to attack here. I'm attacking the darkness. <laughs> <laughs> fine, fine. You attack the darkness. There's an elf in front of you. Whoa! That's me, right? He's wearing a, a, a brown tunic, and he has gray hair and blue eyes. No, I don't. I have gray eyes. Let me see that sheet. Well, it says I have... Well, it says I have blue, but I decided I wanted gray eyes. Whatever. Okay, you guys can talk to each other now if you want. Hello. Hello. I am Gallstaff, Sorcerer of Light. Then how come you had to cast Magic Missile? <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 you guys are being attacked. Do I see that happening? No, you're outside by the tavern. Cool, I get drunk. <sighs> There are, there are seven ogres surrounding you. How could they surround us? I had Morton Kaiden's magical watchdog cast. No, you didn't. I'm getting drunk. Are there any girls there? I totally did. You asked me if I wanted any equipment before this adventure, and I said no. But I need material components for all my spells. So I cast Morton Kaiden's faithful watchdog. But you never actually cast it. Roll the dice to see if I'm getting drunk. <sighs> Yeah, you are. Are there any girls there? Yeah. I did, though. I completely said when you asked me. No, you didn't. You didn't actually say that you were casting the spell. So now there's ogres, okay? Ogres? Man, I got an ogre slaying knife. It's got a plus nine against ogres. You're not there. You're getting drunk. Okay, but if there's any girls there, I want to do them. There you have it. A frightening look into America's most frightening pastime. Remember that it's not your children's fault that they're being drawn into a satanic world of nightmare. It's their gym teacher's fault for making them feel outcast when they couldn't do one single pull-up. This is EMZT Radio. Come and let your ears bleed. <laughs> From 1428elm.com, Tobias Forge, Ghost Interview with iHeartRadio Crashes and Burns. Tobias Forge of Ghosts did an interview with iHeartRadio that ended up disappointing fans rather than delighting them. Beware of false advertising. You may have read earlier about the big announcement that Tobias Forge of Ghosts would be doing a live video Q&A on Facebook with iHeartRadio. Fans were practically buzzing with excitement at the prospect of seeing their masked metal god. They were told to leave their questions to possibly have them answered by Tobias on air and maybe even get a shout out. It's just unfortunate that none of it happened like fans were told it would. This was a big deal for Ghost fans since the unmasking of Tobias due to a lawsuit that started last year and recently resolved, kind of, fans have scoured the internet for new pictures of Tobias and when interviews started filtering in, they were eating it up. Tobias recently did an amazing radio interview, and that left everyone feeling really excited. Not only would we hear him talk about the music, 
But the burning questions plaguing fans may be answered and we would see it happen. Tobias came as himself, in a way. He sported a wig and we can only assume a fake mustache looking like a sweet-ass musketeer or a resident of the parade from We Happy Few. In summary, he looked fabulous. Tobias Forge is very soft-spoken and articulate, but it was very hard to tell because he was never allowed to get a word in. Big Rig was the interviewer, and we left that live feed knowing more about his likes and childhood memories than about Tobias Forge. All of the questions asked were regurgitated from past interviews, and no questions from the fans were offered and no shout-outs given. Not only did Big Rig talk over Tobias, interrupt him, and tell a long diatribe about his childhood love of British comedy, but even Tobias looked uncomfortable. No one in the comments was happy, and most fans felt cheated. The interview was only 40 minutes long, and 60% of that was hearing Big Rig answer his own questions. Whether he was nervous or he didn't know anything about the band is unknown, but a different interviewer may have offered better results. We did get a little bit of new information, including how Forge sees the character of Cardinal Copia. He mentioned seeing him as a stereotypical immigrant American and a father or grandfather figure with stereotypical dad lingo. That sometimes goes over the heads of crowds in different parts of the world. We paid pretty close attention to the comments section to see what people were saying regarding this interview and what it means for the band. Most were excited to see Ghost's leader on stage, mostly, unmasked and discussing the music we all enjoy. Some, however, were not happy that the mystery was further getting chipped away with every interview that he does. We disagree and think that it takes nothing away from the quality of the music and the pageantry that the band offers. Hopefully, iHeartRadio will learn from this experience. This was a huge opportunity for them, for the fans, and a big step for Ghost, and iHeartRadio fell flat on its face and took the entire interview down with it. You can see the interview on their Facebook page. Tobias did a great job with what he was given, and we hope to see more of him in future interviews. And this whole experience has taught me how to be a better interviewer and not have a big, fat mouth and talk over people. I've learned my lesson. You are listening to EMZT Radio. No one in the history of torture has been tortured with torture like the torture you'll be tortured with. Chronicity, a state of prolonged duration, recurrent, habitual, chronic. A new miniseries on chronic pain and illness by your friends Matt and Phil from Semi-Intellectual Musings. We go beyond medical diagnosis to explore the often forgotten political, social, and personal sides. You'll hear stories from extraordinary people overcoming extraordinary challenges. Authors, entrepreneurs, volunteers, coaches, and caregivers. They are so much more than their diagnoses, yet each have found ways to persevere. You'll also hear some familiar voices from the indie podcast community. Showing that art, creativity, and passion are possible while living in chronicity. These stories and more starting April 1st at thesim.podbean.com. EMZT Radio is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30 day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash EMZT. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. For you, the listeners of EMZT Radio Podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. That's audibletrial.com slash EMZT.
spinning steel shit hit. In this house, the doors say red rum, and every day is an excellent day for an exorcism. We have old friends for dinner, and we see dead people because sometimes we all go a little mad. So if you want to play a game, when you see the red balloon, be afraid, be very afraid, and whatever you do, don't fall asleep. Welcome to your worst nightmare, because in this house, we dig horror movies. Because this is EMZT Radio. The Horror Gaming Report brought to you by That Tech Shop. Dot com. Head over right now to thattechshop.com and type in the code EMZT at checkout for 20% off of all items for PC, PlayStation 4, and Xbox. And now it's time for the Horror Game Report. Shit, is it gamer or game? Gaming. And now it's time for the Horror Gaming Report. This is an article... From the usgamer.net, seven horror games from 2018 that will scare you straight into 2019. We dug through the trenches of 2018 to uncover seven essential horror games to play for the spooky season. From games that take inspiration from the original PlayStation to thrilling virtual reality experiences, there's something for everyone in this roundup of horror games of 2018. The Impatient. The Impatient is a VR game developed by Supermassive Games, the creators of the cult hit Until Dawn. It's a prequel to that same game, set in the Blackwood Sanatorium. Unlike Until Dawn, The Impatient is played from a first-person perspective, fitting for virtual reality, and you get to choose the gender of your character from the start. It has plenty of jump scares and a cool control mechanic of talking aloud to answer questions, determining your route in very much the same way as Until Dawn's choice-based narrative. Horror games are the scariest in VR because it's inescapability, and somehow talking out loud just makes it all the scarier. You can get this at Amazon for PS4 and PSVR for $19.99. The light keeps us safe. From the developers behind Sir, you are being hunted and the signal from Tolva comes a new game in Steam Early Access. The light keeps us safe. It is an apocalyptic survival horror where your greatest tool is light and the dangers lurk in. Well, the darkness. You won't find any monsters in the gruesome traditional sense, only in alien machines that are afraid of the light which is your advantage to surviving the procedural generated environment. To survive, you solve puzzles and overcome enemies if your flashlight is upgraded enough. It's also very tense, which really is all you can ask for in a survival horror game. Get it on Steam for PC for $19.99. None Massacre Some horror games subsist on excellent audio design and Puppet Combo's Nun Massacre, also known as Night of the Nun, is one of them. Nun Massacre's concept is immediately recognizable. You must escape a killer nun. She is scary and wants to kill you, and the telltale sign that she's on your tail, whether she's lurking in the shadows or loitering in a hallway, is the horrific music that kicks in accenting by blood-curdling screams. I hate it so much it gives me goosebumps. And yet, I love Nun Massacre and its PlayStation 1 era low-poly goodness. It also has some great filters, like a black and white one, to make things extra creepy. It's cheap, too, at just under $5. Puppet Combo also curated a killer combo on itch.io for $14.95 called the Spooky Retro Bundle 2, which contains this very game alongside their retro-inspired horror treats. You can get it on itch.io for PC and Mac for $4.95. September 1999 Despite the popularity of found footage horror films from the Blair Witch Project to Paranormal Activity, it's relatively rare that we see it exercised in video games. This year's September 1999, a free game that scared players across Steam and itch.io, embraces the format, though. 
It's a short game running precisely at five minutes and 30 seconds. You explore a house happening upon some disturbing images while holding a camcorder before it comes to an end. For being a short little indie game that's available for free, it looks confoundingly realistic thanks to the VHS effect. It's almost like you really are wandering around a seemingly empty house. Name your own price on itch.io for PC and Mac. Transference. We played Transference over a year ago at Ubisoft events, not knowing that it was secretly a horror game. I wouldn't blame you if you didn't know either, as most of its promotion has been relegated to FVM films of actor Elijah Woods. A producer at the studio, Spectre Vision, that co-developed the game, Talking at the Screen. Transference released quietly back in September. It retains the element of FMV and can even be played outside of VR. We recommend it in VR, though, because of how it startled us to death after we made a wrong move in an environmental puzzle, only to turn around with the barrel of a shotgun in our face when we demoted it way back when. Ugh. Get it on Steam for PlayStation Network, etc. For PlayStation 4, PlayStation VR, Xbox One, PC, HTC Vive, Oculus Rift for $24.99. Visage. Even if we'll never get Silent Hills, at least PT's legacy has stretched far and wide in the gaming world, especially among independent developers. Visage is one of the greatest, biggest examples of a game inspired by Hido Kojima and Guillermo del Toro's playable teaser. Earlier this month, it hit Steam's early access, terrifying home exploration and all. Much like in PT, you're exploring a house. Through exploration, it has more in common with, say, Gone Home. The more you explore, the more the house changes, just like in PT's hallway. All you know is a family has been murdered here, and it's up to you to piece together how and why. It even has a sanity system, similar to Amnesia, The Dark Descents, where you'll need to stay in the light to keep your mind in check. If you're on the hunt for an eerie atmosphere to keep you on edge, be sure to check out Visage. Get it on Steam for PC for $24.99. Yumi Nikki. In the early months of 2018, a cult classic finally reached Steam, Yumi Nikki, the famous freeware game from anonymous developer Kikiyama, who mysteriously vanished before finishing updates on the game. Yumi Nikki is a game very near and dear to our heart personally, and it's one we wholeheartedly recommend during the Halloween season. It may not be scary in the traditional sense, but it has an atmosphere that's fitting for nightmares and good dreams alike. It's free too, so what's stopping you? And if you prefer a non-RPG maker-made experience, it's 3D imagining developed this year. It's another option too. Get it for free on Steam for PC. And that concludes Scorpio Girl with a Horror Gaming Report. And you're listening to EMZT Radio. Everything horror from the human race to entertainment. When I was going up the stairs, I met a man who wasn't there. He wasn't there again today. I wish I wish he'd go away.
from iHorror.com, Madman might be getting a modern makeover. This one I'm not too happy about. It's another one they need to leave it alone. Perhaps hoping to get the same value of success as recent reboots of popular 80s horror films, producer Gary Sales wants to bring that decade's popular drive-in slasher Madman into the modern age. No, leave it the fuck alone! Madman doesn't stray far from the slasher script machine. A deformed killer named Madman Mars is on the loose in the woods, dispatching victims in various ways until there is only one left standing. Horror site Bloody Disgusting got wind of the pitch and reached out to Sales for more details. He says he's already written a script and it, quote, springs from the original campfire tale DNA of the 80s slasher, end quote. Sales says... The process to get it to the screen is already in motion. As with all films, they need a studio, a production company, and a bankroll from people who, he says, quote, sees the incredible value and potential of Madman as an icon of fright and a horror brand that could last another 38 years, end quote. Madman technically is an icon. He's just more obscure. <laughs> Sales is adamant the movie is a classic and with each new medium gathers more and more fans. He says the film has followers from all over the world, including one Hollywood director currently making a Manson family picture. Quote, and that includes Quentin Tarantino, who's always been a champion and great fan of the picture. End quote. Sales explains, quote, it was his programming it at the Alamo Drafthouse midnight shows that kept us alive coming into the 21st century, end quote. As for the story, that has changed a little bit, but not too much. The famous campfire scene is still there, although he doesn't say if the foreshadowing campfire ditty will remain. Sales reveals that the new movie will be more interactive, quote, meaning some of the victims have a chance, he said. There will be something to root for, end quote. He adds, quote, even before... It's become so popular, I'd been rewriting Madman with a female lead who has to find her courage in the midst of the murder and mayhem of that terrible night, end quote. Recently, sales noticed that Box Office Mojo's list of 100 slashers didn't include Madman, so he decided to do something about it. He wrote on social media, quote, Madman grosses exceeded a number of movies shown, and I've sent Box Office Mojo the info to correct. When corrected, Madman will be around number 90 of the top 100 slashers in the last 40 years, end quote. Well, okay, I mean, he should be on the 100 list of slashers, Madman. But it's it's all during the time, I think it came after the original Friday, the first Friday the 13th. So it should be right up there with Jason, but he's just more obscure because it's a total urban legend story. No! Stop rebooting horror 80s slashers. It loses its flavor. (laughs) It loses it. And they screw up the story. Madman is one of my favorite camp films. I just, I enjoy it. It's a basic story. And he slashes pretty much like Jason, except, you know, he mostly uses an axe instead of a machete. And he's pretty deformed. That he doesn't hide his face, not like Jason does. So anyway, what's your opinion about this? I personally am pissed. So (laughs) (sighs) there goes Madman on the list of remakes. Great joy. And you're listening to EMZT Radio. Now it's time for my story. My story deals with a man who used to live in that old dilapidated house behind those trees. We're not supposed to be this close to it because uh, many strange things happen around here. He was a farmer with his family, wife and two children. He was an evil man. Ugly and mean. He'd beat his wife and brutally punish his children. He'd drink at the tavern and (laughs) fight all the time. He once had a piece of his nose bitten off in a brawl and didn't feel a thing. It was a night like tonight, many, many years ago. Wait a minute. 
Now that I think about it, it was the same night as tonight. The woods, quiet and dark. The farmer, for no apparent reason, went stark, raving mad. He walked into his bedroom with an axe in his hand and chopped his sleeping wife into little pieces. Then, with his bloodlust awakened, he walked down the hall to his son's room and took an axe to him, and he still wasn't finished. He walked across the hall to his daughter's room, and without so much as a word, he chopped her into little pieces too. Then, he calmly walked into the tavern, lifted the bloody axe onto the bar, and ordered himself a beer. Well, it wasn't long before the town found out what happened, and when it did, it was all over for the mad farmer, or so they thought. Ten men jumped him and dragged him screaming to the nearest tree, where they quickly looped a thick rope around his neck and hoisted him high into the air. One of them grabbed the bloody axe and swung it at the farmer's head, leaving a deep, bloody gash in the side of his face. They left him there, hanging for dead. Next morning, when they went to cut him down, he was gone. It was then they noticed the bodies of his wife and children were missing. And their bodies have never been found. Oh, Max, come on. How could their bodies never be found? I mean, where could they be? I don't know, Richie. All I do know is that on certain nights, when the moon is full, he's out there stalking in the woods, searching for people so he can chop their heads off with an axe or hang them from a tree. Is she trying to be funny or something? What's this farmer's name anyway? Huh, Richie, I have a good reason I haven't told you his name. A very good reason. You see, it is said also that if you say his name above a whisper in the woods, he will hear you because he can be anywhere, anytime. And if he hears you call his name, he'll come for you. And if he comes for you, he'll get you. One by one, you'll start to fall before night's over. I'll get you all. His name is Madman Ma. What do you say? I couldn't hear him. His name is Ma. Mad Man Mars. Hey, Mars! Mad Man Mars! Here we are! Come and get us, Mad Man! <laughs> Mad Man Mars! Oh, Richie, now you've done it. Don't you realize you're fooling with things beyond your control? The Mad Man Mars doesn't understand anymore. The Mad Man Mars thinks you're making fun of him. He didn't mean it, Mars! He's young and foolish and doesn't know what he's doing! Stay where you are, we mean you no harm! Let's hope that stopped him in time. If not, no one is safe in the woods tonight. Anyone alone in the woods you can't hear him. You can't see him. You smell this odor of death. And you turn around and suddenly... This horribly mutilated face stares down at you. It's the last thing you see before zap! Off goes your head. I hope you enjoyed my little story. We have such sights to show you. Quiet, please. Quiet, please. The American Broadcasting Company presents Quiet, Please, which is written and directed by Willis Cooper and which features Ernest Chappell. Quiet, please, for today is called Calling All Souls.
tell you what happened last Halloween. Or All Souls, or All Hallows, or whatever you call it in your part of the country. I bet you can't guess where I was. Well, I was a couple of places. But where I started... I was sitting in a tight little room in a great big house. You ever been west? Well, you know when you cross the Mississippi River on the Santa Fe from Illinois to Iowa? About four or five hours out of Chicago... Fort Madison, Iowa. Ever notice that great big place right alongside the riverbank to your right? The big high walls and the towers and the big gates. That's right, the Iowa State Prison. That's where I was last Halloween. In a little cell. Oh, very comfortable. All by myself. Waiting. And not much more time to wait. Sure. The death cell. I was just sitting there playing solitaire on the edge of my bed, trying not to think of what was coming up and thinking of nothing else but that. I was pretending I'd paid the house $52 for the deck and the house would pay off $5 for every card I got up the top row. I was $32 to the good this particular hand. I didn't hear anybody come up. I didn't hear anybody except the guard walking around. So this voice spoke to me. Red nine on the ten of clubs, Lewis. Oh. Hello, Delbert. Yeah, that's right. Coming in? Yeah. How are you? I'm all right. So far. How are you? All right. Sit down. Yeah. Soap, huh? Turn us down. That's right. What do you say? Oh, a lot of things. What? What's the difference? He said no. It's tough, Delbert, when I didn't do it. It's tough on me, too, Lewis. Yes, but they're not going to hang you. I begged him to give you a two week stay at least, but he said his conscience wouldn't let him. Conscience, huh? He said if he felt I could turn up anything at all in two weeks, he'd be tempted to give you the benefit of the doubt. You've had three stays now. Could you turn up anything? Lewis. Yeah, I know. I've done everything I could. I know. But I didn't do it, Delbert. I know you didn't. But proving it. You want to play cards? I guess I don't want to play either. Well, I've done my very best, Lewis. My very level best. I know, I know. It's pretty tough on me, though. Ain't it? Certainly is. No hope at all? No hope at all. No witnesses? Plenty of motive? Your fingerprints all over everything? I remember. Only I didn't do it. Who did you? Got any idea, Lewis? No idea at all. I thought maybe. I just opened the door after I'd knocked a dozen times. I just opened the door, and they were on the floor, I told you. I know. And I was so shocked. You know, I couldn't help it. I tried to... That's how I got the fingerprints all over. You told me. I... I admit I didn't like Harris. I didn't go for Etta very much either. But I didn't kill him, Delbert. You told me. I, I just went out there to ask him to let me have however, however much he could of that $2,000 he owed me for the pigs. You should have made all those statements about how you were going to get the money or else. I know it. He shouldn't have gone through his desk looking for the money either. I don't know why the Dickens you did that. Well, well, I don't know either, but I was... I said I was shocked. I just thought this was a good way to get the money if I could find it. Nobody would know, I figured. I knew if I didn't get it then, I'd never get it. They were... Lying there on the floor? Lewis, listen, it was pretty hard to convince a jury you didn't do it with them lying on the floor and you going through the desk and blood spots on your suit and everything. I know it, Delbert. I was crazy to do it. But I didn't murder him. I know that, I told you. Delbert. Are they sure enough going to hang me? Unless... Unless what? They discover new evidence. 
Where are they going to discover that? They'll have to do it awful fast. Where are they going to discover it? You tell me. There isn't any more evidence. Whoever really did it covered his tracks too good. I'll say he did. Oh, you smooched it up fooling around? Oh, my gosh, Delbert, I was just trying to see if I could help. And seeing if you could find the money, Harris owed you. Well, I know it was foolish, Honestly, but... Honestly, Lewis, now, you wouldn't expect anybody in his right mind to believe your story, But it's you? true, I tell you. I know it's true, but I couldn't make the jury believe it. Or the governor. How do you know it's true? What? How do you know it's true? Why, I just know it, Lewis. I've seen murders before, you know. You... Don't think I'm a murderer? Of course not. Delbert, don't you really think there's a chance of uncovering some new evidence? Really? I think the only people who saw the murder, the only people who know who did it, are Harris and Etta themselves. But they're dead. That's right, they're dead, Lewis. Look, uh, what I stopped in for, I... Uh, you want me to ask Father McIntyre to come around and see you now? Thirteen steps up with your hands fastened behind you. Thirteen steps. Stop and turn around. The man says, stand here. Look down the thirteen steps at the reporters, the doctor with a stethoscope hanging around his neck. Feel a man tying your feet together. Feel the floor give a little underfoot. See how the man stays away from the little trap door, reaching out to make the rope tight around your ankles. Listen. Father McIntyre's voice in your ear. A little rustling behind you in the black hood over your head and you can't see anymore. But you can feel... Feel the rope as it brushes against your neck a little hairy and creepy crawly on your skin. The weight of the knot, nine turns on your shoulder. The floor gives a little underfoot. No. I can't. I, I can't. I thought I didn't do it. I tell you, I didn't do it. All I could think of was what my lawyer said, what Delbert said before he got up and opened the door and went away. The only people who saw the murder. The only people who know who did it are Harris and Etta themselves. And Harris and Etta knew I didn't do it. Maybe they didn't know who it was that did it, but they did know that I didn't do it. Maybe they didn't. And maybe they did. Maybe they did know. Maybe they could tell me. Maybe they could discover some new evidence, the way Delbert put it. Maybe they could tell me where to go, who to look for, what I'd find... I could tell it all to Delbert. He could go tell the governor I'd get a stay. Maybe the evidence would be good enough so I'd... So they'd let me go. Maybe they wouldn't hang. But Harris is dead. And that is dead. I saw them dead on the floor of their house when I went... And they accused me of murdering them. They found me guilty. I'm in the death cell. Waiting. Harris, Hedda, don't let me die. Don't let them. Hedda, Harris, have mercy on my soul. And when I heard the bell tolling somewhere in the distance, I remembered. I remembered what night this was. This was all souls night. This was the night when the souls of the weary dead walked the earth again. I remember when graveyards yawn and tombs give up their dead. And the sound of the bell tolling away in the darkness of early evening. Calling all souls. Calling all souls. So I had to leave my body when I walked up the 13 steps and after. If my soul had to leave my body then, 
why could it not leave my living body for a while and go seeking after the others that stepped from the tomb this night? The souls of the weary dead, the souls of the unhappy dead, the murdered, the kindly souls that knew. Then I sat down again quietly. The fit of deadly terror was gone for a moment. I was exhausted and weak. I closed my eyes and the sound of a distant bell faded out as I thought. Why can't it be possible, I thought. All these things are not mere superstition. There's some foundation in every belief, I thought. I, I can't die. I'm innocent, I thought. And only those two know the truth. Calling all souls. I repeat it again to myself. Calling all souls. And I stood up. I stood up in that brightly lighted, sorrowful place. And as I rose, I turned to look behind me. And there, on the bed, still in an attitude of despair at my body. And in a flash of darkness, the place faded away, the stone walls and the iron bars and the bare narrow bed, the man in prison uniform seated motionless on its edge. And I stood alone in the darkness of a place I knew. Tall marble shafts gleaming faintly in the starlight, curving gravel roadways hedge bordered the scent of moldering flowers in the darkness. A dry rustle of a weather-beaten flag at the head of a low mound beside me. And loneliness, all aloneness, pressing inward upon me like a living thing. The eve of all souls. And suddenly, quietly in the cold shadows, a little little whispers of innumerable voices. The voices of the wandering souls that hastened past me, seeking their dusty desires across the face of the world they once all knew. And then a voice, speaking to me in the dark, speaking my name in the darkness, calling me. Lewis. And another voice. Lewis. And I knew I had won, for these were the voices of the two they said I murdered. Why, of course you didn't, Louis. Of course you didn't. And a little child, a little boy, ran up in the darkness and took my hand and laughed to hear my name. Do you remember little Tommy, our little boy that died when he was sick? And I remembered. And in the darkness I saw many another I'd all but forgotten. Charlie Cullum that was killed at Romaine in the Argonne 30 years ago. Albert Newhouse, my Boy Scout comrade that drowned so many years ago. Grace Williams, who died at her husband's hand. Crowds and crowds of the ones who had gone before, spending this, their brief holiday on their well-loved earth. And I, the only living soul among them, spending my brief moment with them to seek my life from them. On All Souls Eve a year ago. And I said, help me. And Etta answered me. What is there we can do now, Louis? You know I didn't kill you, Etta. Of course. Of course. They're going to hang me for it. You didn't do it. But how can I prove it? Delbert said if we could find new evidence... There's plenty of evidence, Louis, to be found. Where? How? Why, let me see. He found the money. That's why you couldn't find it, Louis. Uh, uh, but if he found the money, it must be gone by now. No, he has some of it left. But what good does that do? Why, there's a list of the numbers of the bills somewhere. They looked for it. They, they couldn't find it. Have them look in the bedroom, Louis, behind the third drawer in my chest of drawers. I know where it is. It fell down there. Oh, that that's wonderful. That... that... What good will it do now? Unless we know... Unless you tell me... There's plenty of evidence, Lewis, if you'll just look for it. He ripped his coat on the catch of the living room door. 
There's threads there that could be identified. You know who did it? You know who did it? Yes, we know. Yes, we know. Then tell me. Tell me and I'll see. Delbert will see that he confesses. Look. I, I tell you they're going to hang me for it. Do you hear? Tell me. Oh. And you still hate me. And you haven't learned mercy since since you You're going to let me die because you hated me while you were alive. Lewis. You're going to carry it beyond the grave. You're going to keep it to yourself and let me hang. You hated us, Louis. Yes, I hated you and I hate you now. Ghost or no ghost, soul or no soul, I hate No. No, Harris, have pity on me. It's all over now. There's no use hating me. Don't you hate the man that killed you? Don't you? No, Louis. No. We don't hate him. But you hate me. You're going to let me die. You know I'm innocent. You're going to let me die just because we didn't like each other on earth. Louis, listen to us. There's no such thing as hate anymore with us. Then why don't you give me a chance to live? Go back, Louis. Go back to your body. Go back. Go back. To die. Dying isn't so bad, Louis. You don't see any unhappiness among all these souls, do you? I don't want to die. You'd rather save your life for a while at the expense of somebody else's life? But I'm not guilty. And he is. Go back, Louis. Go back. I won't go back till you tell me who killed you. Listen to me, Louis. You're tampering with things that... Things that you have no right to know. Your soul has left your body before its time. You have come upon secrets that no living man should know. Your body is waiting for you. Go back to it while there's time. While there's time. It is only this one night that souls may walk the earth. And when morning comes... Well... When morning comes, if you are still here... Louis, I can make you no promises. Go back, Louis. Tell me the man's name. No, Louis. No, it's none of your affair. N none of my affair. Don't you understand what I said to you? They're going to hang me. None of my affair. Listen. Uh... There was no need for you to send your soul out seeking us, Louis. I don't get that. We have been waiting for this night, Louis. Well? Tell him, Harris. He... he will have to come with us now. Yes, that is the law. You should not have come here. Louis, there is still time, but only a little time. If you go back now... I won't go back. I won't go back until you tell me. You have no right here, you know, Louis. But I'm here. And now it is too late. Yes. You will have to come with us. Where are you going? Tell him, Harris. We are going to visit the man who murdered us. You what? I told you there was no need for you to come here, Louis. We have a way of taking care of this man. I don't know what you mean. Haven't you ever heard of haunting, Louis? Come with us now, Louis. No. You must come. You're really going to haunt him? And make him confess? We are going to appear to him, Louis. What he will do, we cannot say. But when he sees oh, us... Well, then I'm going back to the prison. No. no. I'll go back and I'll call the warden. I'll get Delbert. Tell him that there'll be a confession. Delbert will get me a stay of execution. Then when he confesses, I'll be... <laughs> Who is it, Harris? Come with us and you will see. No, I'm, I'm going back to the prison. I told you, get things all set up. No, you changed your mind too late, Louis. Too late? Why? I... No, Louis. You have meddled too much. You have gone too far. The souls of the living have no place here. But you have come. We told you to go back while there was time, Louis. Yes, but now you must come with us. No. No, I want to go back. Come, Louis. I, high up over the face of the 
sleeping starlit world with the tiny lights of the living far below us. The broad peaceful farmlands, the sleeping cities, the broad breast of the great river far below us. The universe throbbing with strange, compelling song. And above us, around us, the sense of a million souls. A million, a myriad, a countless multitude returning joyously to their single night upon the earth they loved. And I looked up in the clearness of the haunted night. And above me, the endless pathway of the Milky Way glowed with a strange splendor. And Atta plucked my sleeve. The pathway of the souls, Louis. The way we all return. And I saw the features of the ones I had loved. Of strangers. Of men and women and little children. Of boys in ragged uniforms. Of bearded ancients and smiling babes in their mother's arms. And on their faces in a sparkling night an expression of awful eagerness. Of long-awaited realization that this night they would once again rest upon the mortal earth. And I... Even I, the only living soul amongst all the multitude of the dead, even I felt an overpowering desire to set my feet again this moment upon the reality of Earth. And I closed my eyes for a moment. And when I opened them, we three were in a room. And on a bed there was a sleeping man. This is the man. This is the man. Who is he? Go and look. I... No. Go and look. I don't want to... Go and look, Lewis. You must go and look, Lewis. He lay there, sleeping as innocently as any child. The covers were drawn up about his face as if he were shutting out some childish fancy of boogeymen in the dark. But I knew him for a wicked, guilty man. The man who held my own life in jeopardy. Look at him, Lewis. Look at him, Lewis. And I lifted up the comforter that hid his face and bent down to look at him. Delbert. Delbert. My friend. The man who had defended me in the courtroom and lost. The man who had gone to the governor. Or had he gone to plead for my life. Delbert, the man who told me, of course I know you didn't do it. Of course he knew. He alone of mortal men knew the murderer. For the defender of the accused man was the murderer himself. Wake him, Lewis. No. Wake him. Delbert. Delbert. Delbert, wake up. Lewis! Lewis, what are you doing here? He came with us, Delbert. Harris! Harris and Etta, Delbert. No! Now go away! You're ghosts! We are human souls, Delbert. Come to hear your testimony. No! No, I won't tell you anything. You murdered them, didn't you, Delbert? No. You murdered us, Delbert. No, no, I... Confess, Delbert. I didn't do it. You did do it. You, Lewis. You can't be here. Confess. Well, I... Confess. Lewis must hear you, Delbert. Lewis. Lewis, I did do it. I killed them, Lewis. I murdered them. I knew I could throw the blame on you. I knew I could get you convicted and I could save myself. I hated them too, Lewis. Oh, Lewis. Lewis, forgive me. Lewis, forgive me. Me forgive you, Dalbert. Ask Harris and Etta to forgive you. Harris. Etta. We have already forgiven you, Dalbert. But you have done a great wrong to Lewis. You will be punished, Dalbert. I'll confess. I'll call the prison. I'm going back to my body now in the prison. Lewis. Thank you. Forgive me. Thank you, Harris. Etta. Lewis. I'm going back. Oh, Harris, you... Wait, Lewis. What? Lewis. Be quiet, murderer. What, Harris? You can't go back, Lewis. I can't go back. Why? What have I... What? You must 
Stay, please. Stay? Stay? Why must I stay? My body's back there in the prison waiting for me. I've got to go back and live. No, Louis. Why? Tell me why. Everything's all... What's the matter? You tell him, Delbert. Louis. Well? Louis. They hanged you half an hour ago. Today's Quiet Please story is Calling All Souls. It was written and directed by Willis Cooper, and the man who spoke to you was Ernest Chappell. And Kermit Murdoch played Delbert. Harris and Etta were respectively Ralph Schoolman and Mary Patton. Mr. Cooper and I are very grateful for the superb efforts of Albert Berman, who was always responsible for our Quiet Please music. So until next week at the same time, I am quietly yours, Ernest Chapel. We better get back, because it'll be dark soon, and they mostly come at night. Mostly. You love midnight movies, don't you? <laughs> but can you handle midnight movies 24 hours a day? Your death will be indescribable. Find out on Black Flag TV. Ah, ben! Ben! The first viral television on the web. Black Flag TV is entirely dedicated to haunting horror, science fiction, and cult movies. Broadcasting live, 24 hours a day, obscure independent movies and classic horror. Make Black Flag TV your sanctuary for the horror genre. They're coming to get you, Barbara. Visit us now, blackflag.tv. Of the night, 
There shall be no ring bearer to pledge allegiance to happiness. In the darkness of the night, there's a flower that blossoms. Tears make it grow. Hail to the maker of the soil that gives birth. In the darkness of the night. In the darkness of the night, there are shadows of shadows standing in line for the taste of my success. At least I know what. In the darkness of the night. It boils my blood and dries up my tears. Can't cry. In the darkness of the night, through the fire in my eyes, you can see the future beating the present. So at home, in the darkness of the night, in the darkness of the night, I met tribulation. He was hard and soul and spiritless, with a grin on his face. In the darkness of the night, I'm in a cave that sits in a corner. Many times I've called out as my pen struck the bar, but there was no answer. So my writing rescued me from the dark of the night. You sucked out her brains? Yeah, right through her mouth. Is she dead? Of course she's dead. What, are you kidding? Sinister Sisters. <laughs> Welcome to another Sinister Sisters. I'm Bane Hellborn with my sister, Scorpio Girl. And Scorpio Girl had this idea of doing DID or multiple personalities disorder. Yeah, dissociative identity disorder. Disorder, yes. So I've got some movies that talk about it, and she's got some actual facts. Well, it's kind of like real life people versus, but you know, the movies that we see, most of them are based off of real Mm -hmm. people. We just don't, you know. And I'm using a website that's actually medical website, traumadisassociation.com. So it's these doctors actually reviewed these movies and they talk about how accurate they are, if at all, and if they're based on real people or not. So, yeah. So how do you want to start this off? I was going to say, some of these I haven't seen. Probably a lot of these I haven't seen. (laughs) Yeah. The only reason why I uh, thought about doing this was because way back when, I remember you showed me this movie called uh, Raising Cain with John Lithgow. Yes. And previous to watching this movie, I'd only known John Lithgow to be one of those quirky... Comics. Comics. And when he did this, it was amazing Mm -hmm. like I thought he did a really good deal Mm -hmm. but with this movie it's kind of like his parents were therapists no his father or his it was it his His dad oh I thought it was both the mom and dad no but his his father father was a a therapist a child psychologist okay (laughs) yeah you can finish it a child child psychologist who wanted to write about child development and he made personalities of his son like cause traumas to make these splits happen and he was writing a book about how child DID development happens it was pretty interesting yeah. how long ago was that? that was in the 90s I remember I was a kid yeah it was in the <laughs> 90s that but was a fucked up way of a doctor to do that I don't know if it's based on a real case but that was a fucked up way for a doctor to learn about the, the disorder I just thought John Lithgow, from all I knew, was him being a comedian to doing this. I was yeah. just, like, very impressed. It was kind of scary, too. It was. It was very scary. Mainly because of the jump scares. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But there was one personality that he did was just very scary because she didn't speak. 
Right. She didn't speak. Yeah, silence is pretty scary. But you could tell what she was meaning. Right. Scary. I mean, yeah. I mean, I remember when I was pregnant and I picked up for the first time and read Sybil out loud. <laughs> yeah, I believe that's on my they list here. Said, they said, read your baby, but I didn't have a vast array of books. And I remember Sybil was there and I read the whole thing <laughs> yeah. out loud. <laughs> yeah. And that's based on an actual case. That was. Yeah. That's reading the on book, my list. Reading the book versus watching the movie is... Too different. Really different. Yeah. I mean, they're, they, they like, wash. I mean, of course, movies, like, wash over real life because, you know, you've got to make it more interesting or you've got to make it more... Well, Sybil's was too horrifying to put into... There's no Because this was back in the 70s. Right? But yeah. Sybil's mother was one... I mean, oh. from the book. From the book. I mean, in she the movie, too. She was way scarier but in the than book, the movie. That, that person... I, I don't even want to call it a human because... Dude, Sybil's mother was just evil from the core. But that's on my list, too. But it was mainly saying that mom was schizophrenic. Uh, she yeah. was every mental disorder. I, I yeah. swear. As far as the book, you could just chip away at the mother's personality and, and see that she had... She was way more than just, you know, schizophrenic. Like, yeah. there was a, a vast array of mental disorders in that one. Yeah. Anyway, uh, Voices Within, The Lives of Trudy Chase, based on an actual person, Trudy Chase, she had, she was a high-functioning, polyfragmented disassociative identity disorder, meaning she had a large number of alternate personalities, 92 of them. Jeez. And uh, this was May 1990. Shelley Long was Trudy Chase. So they said, uh, psychology, broadly correct, very well explained. It avoids the mental illness stigma, and it is based on an actual person. And I didn't see this movie. I don't know why. It slipped my radar, I guess. How old is that? 1990. Oh, I have, I have the real thing. Yeah. Judy Chase was just two years old. She moved out to the country with her mother and stepfather. At this time, she was sexually abused by her stepfather, and the trauma ultimately caused her DID. For years, Chase was able to suppress her memories by holding them in alternate personalities that rarely came to the surface. Each of her 92 personalities served different roles and held different memories. One personality, named Black Catherine, held most of her rage. Another personality, Rabbit, held the pain. Chase wrote a book about her life when Rabbit howls. Her life was also turned into a made-for-TV called The Voices Within. Yeah. Wow. And her personalities, because there's so many, they were called The Troops. I mean, 92 of them? Yeah, The Troops. Holy smokes. So uh, this challenges the common total amnesia stereotype of DID, which says everyone with DID have no memory at all of the actions of their alternate personalities. So with that yeah. many personalities, I wonder how long... Trudy is actually gone dormant. I mean, there's got to be chunks of her mm -hmm. life missing. Mm -hmm. I mean, to think with that many... Well, because she was high functioning. So nobody knew. They, they were so... So maybe, maybe they, were, they were rapidly cycling that she was able to like have chunks of a day. Yeah. Each day. Yeah. And then Sybil, 1976. Sally Field did an excellent job of portraying several different personalities she had she had a few it is based on a real person named shirley ardell mason i found one about that uh, where um one of the most famous cases of sybil um follows the life of a woman who has the idea it was supposedly a true story but it seems that the real life sybil shirley mason faked her condition Mason initially sought psychiatric attention because she was emotionally unstable. She became attached to her physician, Dr. Connie Wilbur, who had a fascination with multiple personality disorders. To get more attention, Mason came in one day and started claiming to be a different person, talking in a childish voice, and changing her mannerisms. On one occasion, Mason tried to admit that she was faking it, but her confession was dismissed as part of her psychosis. Uh, interestingly, uh, therapist Herbert Spiegel, 
who saw Mason from time to time, also said that it was possible um, faking it in 1997. So there's still up to debate whether... But don't you think if someone was DID that their personalities wouldn't want you to know that they existed? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there was even a 2007 version with Jessica Lange. But... Ooh. Yeah. And... uh, this is saying that the 1976 version is far superior to the 2007. I mean, for its time yeah. and the content of it. I mean, I know when I saw it, I was pretty much blown away by this being a real thing. I think I think watching Sybil was my first kind of like peek into that this is yeah. a real thing. Yeah, it's the most well-known account of someone with DID. Yeah. And then this was moved, she was moved to a post-traumatic stress disorder in 1980. Oh. Yeah. And uh, a year before the book Sybil was published, Dr. Wilbur jointly published a research paper about another case called the objective study of multiple personality or are four heads better than one. <laughs> oh my goodness. So Sybil is, was like the, yeah, the very first type of multiple personality movie that I've seen. And I saw this when I was very young, not in 76. I was only five years old at the time, but I know I saw it when I was a little older, probably boom dooms age. Yeah, I, I'll have to say, I, I remember being young. Remember, our mom really... made us watch the movie. Yes. <laughs> she, yeah. She made us watch the movie. She made us watch a lot of different movies where I would think, what is she trying to say? Yeah, <laughs> me too. I kind of got scared at that point. Yeah. I didn't see this one. Frankie and Alice, 2010. Halle Berry. It's... Uh... Based on real Francine L. Murdoch, psychologically broadly correct, DID no longer treated using hypnosis or drugs to recover memories. Violence is not linked to DID. Child alters are very common. Doesn't explain why the altered genius was created. Well, um, here's an interesting real live case. After you said that, Mm -hmm. um, there was uh, Juanita's... Juanita Maxwell's alter actually committed murder. Mm. So uh, Juanita Maxwell has no memory of beating 73-year-old Inez Kelly to death with a lamp in 1979. Wanda Weston, however, remembers the incident with glee. She admitted as much during the murder trial. The catch, Juanita and Wanda happened to occupy the same person. So how it came to be is Maxwell had been working as a maid at a hotel where Kelly was staying. According to Wanda, Kelly had borrowed her pen but refused to give it back. Wanda went into Kelly's room and, when the older woman asked her to leave, killed her. After Maxwell's altar was coaxed out during the trial, the judge ruled that she was not guilty due to insanity and Maxwell was committed to a mental institution. So, you never know. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, David and Lisa, 1962... Kier Dulia Janet Margolin. This is two patients in a residential school for disturbed teens. If you dislike the labeling kids with mental disorders or traditional psychiatric approaches, then this movie might just appeal to you. Both David and Lisa are seen as odd by both society and their peers. David is exceptionally smart, normally hostile, and fears being touched. Lisa only speaks in rhymes if she speaks at all. Hardly anyone likes David, yet he befriends the friendless Lisa, who sometimes, when she has switched to her altar Muriel, runs and jumps around like a young child asks him to play, and terrifies him by keep trying to touch him. Uh, It says, it's psychologically broadly correct. David, a patient, calls Lisa schizophrenic. At the time, DID was called dissociated personality, disassociative reaction, hysteria. Uh, They're not sure... If it's based on a real person, because the diagnosis is so uncertain. Mm. And there are no scenes involving treatment of disassociation, DID, DDNOS. And there's also a 1998 remake. Oh, okay. Ah, Okay. And schizophrenia originally meant a split mind, but not split or multiple personality. Well, it seems like the only kind of cure 
or helpfulness is to integrating the personalities to all work together. So that basically means they all have to acknowledge that each other exists and they all have a primary role, but they all have to respect each other's say. So it kind of like, or they fight against each other for control at the moment. Yeah, but I think the I think the you know integrating them is having them work together. Well, that's for what, the betterment of the host. Well, that's what Sybil movie was trying to do. In the movie, they were Doctor Wilbur was trying to get her to get all her altars to work together, like the two little boy altars wanted to help her have a baby. They could help push it out, but they can't make a baby. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, apparently with the Karen Overhill case, they say it's possible to cure DID. Um, when Karen Overhill was 29 years old, she was referred to a Dr. Richard Bear for treatment for her depression. Throughout their session, she began revealing how she had been abused by both her father and her grandfather. Dr. Bear treated Overhill for over 20 years as he slowly discovered the truth. She had 17 different personalities. Uh, by using hypnosis and visualization, Dr. Bear was able to help Overhill reintegrate her personalities into one functioning whole. And he hmm. wrote about her fascinating case in Switching Time, a doctor's harrowing story of treating a woman with 17 personalities. And apparently singing the praises of curing her DID. But if it were that simple, it that. wouldn't be a disorder, right? right? I mean, if it was that simple, it'd be like taking a pill. Yeah, but it takes almost years for that to work. Well, this says 20 years. Yeah. He spent 20 years with this woman. Yeah. But so see, the, so it wasn't simple. It took 20 years. Yeah, 20 years. But that's interesting how he was able to take 17 personalities and reintegrate them all into one personality. Yeah. Wow. That's pretty intense. Uh, Three Faces of Eve, 1957, <gasps> Joanne Woodward. Yes. So the book and 1957 film were based on the real cr case of Chris Costner Sizemore. Sizemore, who actually died in 2016, actually had 22 distinct personalities. In the book and film, she was portrayed as having only three, mm -hmm. Eve White, Eve Black, and Jane. In reality, Jane's emergence was not the end of Sizemore's suffering. Jane, like Eve White and Eve Black, died being replaced by ever more personalities mm -hmm. there was the banana split girl who would only eat said dessert the spoon lady who collected spoons and many more the personalities also ranged in skill set some could drive and others couldn't it wasn't until four years of therapy with her eighth doctor that sizemore was able to start integrating her personalities she said once she had a dream where the personalities were in a kind of greek arena they all joined hands and then walked behind a screen and then everything disappeared and they've never come back. Hmm. So that was after four years. Wow. Well, this says psychologically broadly correct. 40 years before treatment guidelines, but excellent. Alter personalities are known to integrate or merge or become inactive and not die. It's questionable about avoiding mental illness stigma. The introduction refers to a fictional killer, but the rest is fine. Yes, based on a real person. Headaches and total amnesia for hours at a time are common before treatment. Yeah. So it's right on, but it was still questionable. Here's one of our favorites. Fight Club. <laughs> I live for this Fight movie. Fight Club. Edward Norton, Brad Pitt. This movie gives me life. I don't know why, but this movie gives me life. Okay. And this movie is not correct. It's not based on any real person. It was just someone having an idea of a multi because he had multiple not multiple it was just a split personality because he had only one other personality right so but it's interesting how in the movie how that split personality evolved yeah like from being part of the narrator's personality to branching out on their own so i don't see how the doctors and psychologists could say this isn't correct because there are some cases where, you know, some of the personalities are skilled, but yet the host isn't. Mm -hmm. 
you know, I like, like, you know, some can drive, some can't. There's yeah. even a case in here from, let me find it real quick. But this came, this, this whole movie is all about the host is, can't sleep. Can't sleep at all. Yeah. And kind of blanks out because someone else is awake while he's passed out or something. Yeah. And that's Tyler Durden. But see that we don't know if that's his name or if that was the personality. All we know is the main person talking who we think is the host is called the narrator. Yeah. I'm not a big sports fan, but apparently, and I don't even know what team he's on, but uh, Herschel Walker has a I think that's personality that excels at football. So he's a former player. NFL running back. Herschel Walker wrote about his struggle managing m multiple personalities in his book, Breaking Free. As a child, Walker was overweight and had a speech impediment. He thinks that he first developed a DID as a coping mechanism. The highly motivated warrior was one of Walker's, one of Walker's alters who drove his physical fitness and football ability. Another alter, the hero, was his public face. For years, he managed the disorder without really understanding what it was. He doesn't even remember receiving the Heisman Trophy. After Walker retired from football, his different personalities started to become jumbled. He fell into depression, at one point playing Russian roulette with himself. Walker's wife, Cindy Grossman, left him after an episode where he pointed a gun at her head. It was at that point that Walker sought psychiatric help and was diagnosed with DID. Mm. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. um, I have another one. Kim Noble has four switches per day. Imagine keeping over a hundred different personalities straight. That is the life of Kim Noble told in the autobiographical book of All of Me. Noble was born in 1960 to two unhappily married factory workers in England. Her child care was outsourced to friends and family, and at some point between the age of one and three, she suffered from extreme and repeated abuse. It was at this point that her psyche splintered, completely compartmentalizing the trauma. Her condition went undiagnosed through adolescence, even when she was put on suicide watch in a psychiatric hospital after frequently overdosing. In her 20s, a sudden switch resulted in her plowing a van into a line of parked cars. This resulted in another mental health examination and the diagnosis of schizophrenia. After being released from the mental hospital, Noble somehow ended up caught up with a pedophile ring. Uh, when she reported it to the police, she started receiving threats of retaliation. A man threw acid in her face. Someone lit her bed on fire with her in it while she escaped. Her house was completely gutted. She has no recollection of the incident whatsoever. In 95, Noble was finally diagnosed with DID, and her dominant personality is named Patricia. And under her care, Noble has become an artist and lives with her daughter. Wow. Primal Fear. Edward Norton's first movie back in 96 with Richard Gere. I don't re I don't. I didn't see it. I didn't even know it existed. What's so, it about? Well, it's where Edward Norton's character kills an archbishop. And he doesn't have multiple personalities. He just has it split. Like, there's one bad personality that does all the violence, and then there's one supposedly the real person who's just um, timid. Timid and shy and stutters and doesn't quite remember the events. Mm. So this is another one not based on a real person. It's not really correct, but uh, they do research about disassociative or split personality. They explain it well. But there are no signs of PTSD like he would claim because he was uh, abused by the archbishop. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, DID is never officially diagnosed. He was not diagnosed a disassociative because there was only two personalities. But see, that's the thing about movies. Mm -hmm. If these doctors are basing on movies, a lot of movies don't put in the back history of things. No, but they do talk about the different types of disorders that the Aaron character could possibly have because he doesn't remember but his other personality is kind of proud about what he did because he claims people deserve it and then there's a twist at the end which I'm not going to spoil you got to watch it <laughs> I actually am going to because you need to watch it it's yeah. good and Richard Gere is his lawyer trying to defend him but he doesn't he doesn't quite believe 
and it mixes in some like local politics. So it's really good. It's really good. What you got? Um, I just have like older cases. Uh, there's a strange case of Mary Reynolds. Mary Reynolds was born in 1785 and moved from England to Pennsylvania as a child. She had a solemn and melancholy demeanor and spent a lot of time in religious devotion. At the age of 19, she became blind and deaf for six weeks. Three months after that, she suddenly forgot how to read and write. Then Reynolds' demeanor changed and was described as buoyant, witty, fond of company, and a lover of nature. After five months, she changed back to her original self and altered between the two types for 16 years. When Reynolds reached her mid-30s, the second personality took over once again and remained until her death at the age of 61. Reynolds was studied by Dr. Samuel Latham Mitchell, who published his, an account of her double consciousness in the 19th century. I have actually one of the first well-documented case of what would later become known as DID, uh, studied by Erbhardt Gemlin in 1791. The case involved a 20-year-old woman living in Stuttgart, Germany. She was divided into two personalities, the French woman and the German woman. <gasps> That's my heritage. Mm -hmm. That's our heritage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> The French woman spoke perfect French, behaved like a French aristocrat, and knew about the German woman. The German woman, in contrast, had no idea of the French woman's existence and spoke German with a French accent. But that's the very first um, documentation of DID, mm -hmm. 1791 in Germany. Wow. And then this is another one of my favorites, Identity 2003, John <gasps> Cusack. This was so good that I had to buy it back then on VHS. Yeah. Okay, according <laughs> to this, nothing is right. There is malpractice treatment that goes against treatment guidelines. Dual psychiatrist and defense lawyer role is unethical. Not based on a real person. It does not avoid any mental illness stigma. And it says DID is not treated by killing off alters. So this, you know, this movie is based about they're going through the life of a serial killer who had multiple personalities and you didn't know who was the real personality. And his doctor wanted to break down all the other personalities to find the one, like the person, the real person. Well, it was kind of difficult. This yeah. is this is what this is a perfect mind fuck movie yeah, that I yeah. love because I didn't even know. Yeah, like we, you don't even find out until the very end. Well, who they're actually talking to? There were a few moments of in oh, out of this serial killer's head that you saw what was going on around him but you didn't know but then, that but then you're inside his head but you didn't know you were in his head it was yeah total it alice in was, wonderland thing this is a perfect example of mindfuck yeah. movies that i love to watch yeah. and and i i thought it was brilliant i yeah. mean well and that's the thing about how the doctors said or the psychiatrist said that that's you don't kill them off i mean that's kind of well this is what integration it kind of is no he wanted to kill them like destroy the alternate to where it goes away it doesn't merge but well he was describing it as like they were folding into this person well because they were so vastly contrasted to yeah. the the personalities i mean all of them were there was no way i mean yeah I and mean, there were several women. As, there was several women one. I know, but for me as a, you know, logically thinking about it, I mean, you couldn't, ugh, I don't know. It yeah. was twisted. I just know it was one of those at the very end. I was like, what? What? Yeah. Who the fuck is that? Yeah, no. This, <laughs> so it's not a true representation or anything of a DID. I mean, even though... You know he has all these personalities because I didn't it's, even... clued, it's kind of clued to you in little snips, in little snips. No, I, honestly, I didn't even know this was about multiple personalities until the very end. Yeah. Like, I, I could not follow. I thought it was brilliant. Yeah. I thought it was absolutely brilliant. No, it's, it's, a, it's a very good movie, but it's not correct. It's like someone just having this idea and going with it, which it was great. It was great. It's in my collection. It's in your collection. <laughs> VHS, yeah. baby. <laughs> yeah. No, I got one in DVD. Well, of course you did. Yeah. 
<laughs> but I remember there was a point in my life where uh, we'd go uh, to the gas station and they used to have movies there. Maybe I don't have it in VHS. Maybe it is DHS. No, it's DVD. DVD. Yeah, it's never mind. It's DVD it's because, DVD. Um, yeah, we I used to go to gas stations and they'd have like five dollar dvd two dollar bin <laughs> two dollar bin at the gas station and, and that identity was, was always in there. that was one of my picks yeah. i picked yeah yeah no i absolutely enjoyed this movie i thought it was brilliantly done yeah uh do you have anything else or what else do we want to say about well here's the thing you know when you find yourself talking to yourself mm-hmm. and you have this full on conversation uh-huh. like you're answering yourself back uh-huh. and you're like coming up with shit that you're like, why didn't I think of that? Right. Does that mean we have multiple personalities? I mean, think about it. I'm serious. Like, full-on conversations. And and don't you ever catch yourself being like, well, why didn't I think of that? Yeah. As you're answering yourself. Well, you just did. (laughs) who the fuck are you talking to? No. No, I don't think that's it. I think you're just trying to... It's you trying to work out your problems and you're talking it out. But... You have a conversation with yourself. <laughs> yeah, but you're answering out loud and stuff. Like, and and w- I don't know. Sometimes when I talk to myself, I I hear, like, mm-hmm. I don't just imagine words. I actually hear a, a voice. A voice. Is it your voice or is it someone else? Uh, that's the that's the real question because I can't recall at this point in time. I'll have to like practice listening. A lot of the time, it's my voice. But I I. Seriously, like I, I, there's a lot of times during the day where, you know, I'll be at work or something and I'll start talking to myself and someone will be like, what was that? And I'm like, oh, did I say that out loud? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Whoops. Yeah. I don't know. So people's mental illness makes good movies sometimes. (laughs) It's the basis of life. (laughs) Oh, we didn't talk about Split. (gasps) We have to. That was really good. Okay, Split. Split. That was on another... It wasn't on this DID list. That's interesting because there were different personalities. Yeah. But what was about the evolving? That that could be part of uh, multiple personalities or DID because of the fact that, you know... No, that is a DID because he had more than six. Was it more than six? Yeah. All I remember is the scary woman. Yeah, she was. She was scary. She was crazy. Oh, oh, United States of Terra. Okay, that's a TV show. That was a series. Okay, if anybody can find this, I don't even know if Netflix still has it, but the United States of Terra, Tony Colletti, brilliantly, amazingly. (laughs) Didn't she have, didn't we see like five of them? Yeah, but she... And then she added more as the series progressed. Yeah, Yeah. but she also progressed as well. Yeah. But it was, I mean, this was an amazing example of, uh, she had a family, she had a husband and two kids. Mm Mm-hmm. And trying to manage... Which they were still questioning whether she was herself when she had the kids or if one of the personalities had him. Yeah, and that's the thing because the whole family managed and knew what to do when certain uh, personalities came out. There was um, Alice, who was the 1950s housewife. Mm -hmm. Perfect in every way, super mom. Mm -hmm. Um, Everybody loved Alice because, I mean, who wouldn't love a 1950s super housewife? I'm perfect mother, perfect. I think I liked Alice the most. And then um, Buck. Buck. Oh, my God. Buck was, the, Buck was a man. And it was interesting how uh, Buck, when Buck came out, you know, the trucker hat. He's kind of a trucker, flannel, trucker biker. The Jeffrey Dahmer glasses. Yeah. Uh, he was rough. His voice was even deeper. He was, yeah, a trucker. Trucker, biker. Redneck. Redneck. Ruffian. Um, always picking up women. This is where the husband got pissed because she would always come home with venereal diseases because Buck went out to go screw people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, and there was also, I can't remember her name, but remember the, the, the 15-year-old that would come out? T. 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 That's why she would come home with venereal disease. Wasn't well, it T or Buck? Both. 
both? Both. T was a 15 year old, and, and when T came out, it was the halter tops and the she dressed, side ponytail. She dressed like a teenager well, of uh, the 80s. A punk 80s, yeah. 80s punk. Yeah. But when T got pissed, they had this um, shed that T had to go to. Because T was very violent. And no, wasn't it because there was a gorilla personality? The gorilla the, personality they, yeah. didn't come out until her parents came into the yeah. episodes. Yeah. But she had a gorilla personality. That gorilla personality seemed more to be like a, a virile child. Fear, more, feral. A viral, A viral, feral. 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 A feral child, other more than a gorilla, I think. But anyways, you have to see this TV show. Like I said, it's, yeah, it might it be hard to find, but it's the United States of Terra. Possibly Tony on Amazon. Coletti. Tony yeah. Coletti. Yeah. Oh my gosh, this was amazing. I, I think I binge rewatched it like yeah. five, six, seven times. Yeah. Damn you. I know. I know. <laughs> it was so good. We were hooked. We binged that motherfucker. Yeah. We did. Okay, Split. James McAvoy. Oh, another brilliant lead this portrayed. This is an M. Night Shyamalan film, believe it or not. I don't care what y'all think. I, I like He has movies. hits and misses. Okay? No. This was a Everyone no. was a hit in my eyes. No, the village kind of was a letdown. No, you got to think about it psychologically. Anyways, let's do the Split. Split, sorry. So James McAvoy was... So this said had 23 distinct personalities, but we only saw like five or six, including when he turned into the beast, (gasps) which was the 24th personality. And it looked like he literally grew grew, grew muscles, his chest broadened, his shoulders widened. He grew taller. He grew teeth. And, but that's the thing about... And he became monstrous. But that's the thing about DIDs is because these personalities are personalities. Yeah. Like, you can't just be a personality without portraying becoming, and becoming. becoming. Yeah. But yeah, this was... I mean, the way he switched DIDs, it was so... Oh, good, too. It was so good. You didn't know what was going on. Yeah. Like, uh, let's see. There was Barry was the dominant personality that had that had everyone under control. Uh, Who was the scary woman? Patricia. <gasps> Patricia. Oh, Patricia. gosh. She was intense. Even w- with his shaved head and he was wearing a dress and the personality was just so... Ah, that was creepy. But yeah. totally feminine. Yeah, totally feminine. Totally feminine. And uh, then there was Dennis, which was like the kind of mentally disabled child. Child, yeah. yeah. Like the kind of like autistic. Yeah. And uh, so this person, Kevin, he would kidnap women and keep them. And if they didn't do what he what his personalities wanted, he would kill them. He's trying to free them from the world. And he kidnapped the one girl named Casey, but she has her own issues, which he recognized, and he was trying to help her. So, because she had been molested by her uncle. And she had all the signs that he could recognize, so he knew he had to help her. <laughs> Saw D.I.D. style. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's a very it's a very good movie. It's frightening a lot of the time, and it's being tied into uh, M Night's Unbreakable series. It's being tied in. In fact, uh, Glass Kevin is in Glass. Yeah, but also wasn't it also the Beast? Yeah, the Beast is the one that's also well. That's tied what I'm saying. To the, Unbreakable too. Yeah, the Kevin character with all the personalities is in the Glass m- movie. Yeah. Well, I mean, of course, because at the very end, you see uh, Bruce Willis, Mm -hmm. who was in the Unbreakable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when it comes to DID, think this, kids. When you talk to yourself, is that really you answering back or posing questions? When you go through a breakup and you become a whole new person, are you really becoming a whole new personality as well? (laughs) (laughs) Are you splitting in your mind? Is your mind splitting? (laughs) 
Yeah, I mean, watch that's out even, for these things. That's scary to even think about. This is why I wanted to talk about it, because I think about these things when I'm alone. This is scary. <laughs> You never know. And I mean, there are a lot of cases that I read where, you know, people didn't even realize that they were DIDs until something happened. Mm-hmm. So just uh, be leery of that coworker that comes into work one day. Different. Different. <laughs> Keep an eye, a leery eye out on that one. And then changes again. And then changes again. Yeah. Beware of those who change. A lot. <laughs> they say change comes from within. Be very leery. <laughs> up another episode of emzt radio thank you scorpio girl for sitting in for mj you know he's busy boy getting into a new place not a problem you know i love to pretend i love horror (laughs) (laughs) yeah for those of you who don't know she's not a horror fan but she will sit through some of it it's only because of growing up with you bane and your torment of horror has become to come a staple in my life. <laughs> yeah, just get used to it. Literally. Get used to it. Uh, check out all our links on our Podbean page. Support all our friends, music, and our filmmaking friends. Give them some support. Throw some our way if you can. Definitely. Um, Mr. UK uh, got one of our hoodies and yeah. is still raving about how, you know, high quality it is. It's really thick and warm. Uh, he's wearing Especially it right now. He's wearing it right now in England. Yeah. So, you know, it's like really cold and sleety and snowy and all that. He says Much wearing just his hoodie is, is all right because it's so like high quality and thick and i'm still waiting for pictures yeah they'll come pictures they'll come (laughs) but apparently everybody loves it down on his uh, side of the pond well hopefully he can get them to buy (laughs) some more i know the t-shirts are good too i mean you know i'm not a fan of wearing t-shirts but the logo is tits on a ritz it's cool yeah it's mj's girlfriend designed that yeah interesting thank you ray i didn't know (laughs) that yeah it's, it's a really, I, like I said, I'm not a fan of t-shirts, but that logo is pretty cool. And she's going to be ordering another hoodie. <laughs> I am, yeah. Because yeah. I gave mine to Mr. UK. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so we're waiting to see if MJ will be available next time after he's all moved in and settled. Uh, if not, it's going to be us again. So that's all right. Sorry, folks. <laughs> <laughs> And little boom doom just couldn't decide what to do for minis, so we just left it out. So that's all right. Well, we'll try again next time. Yeah. So stay tuned for another episode of EMZT Radio. EMZT Radio, where we've got everything horror from the human race to entertainment. Don't go surfing porn. It's not the kind of whacking I mean. Mm-hmm.